Welcome to The Economy Magazine at i24 News. I'm Benjamin Chong Alfares with the news from the world markets and the global economy. Coming up, an in-depth look at the U.S. Federal Reserve as it may raise borrowing costs for the first time in nearly a decade. And as sanctions are about to be lifted, Iran is ready with mega malls and an abundance of Western-style consumerism. First headlines. Shares in Japan rose for a third straight day on Thursday as investors felt more assured that the U.S. wouldn't raise rates this week. Investors shook off a downgrade of Japan's economy as the Nikkei stock average added 1.4 percent. But stocks in China gave up gains from earlier in the day, with the Shanghai Composite Index ending down 2.1 percent. With the biggest Fed decision in years set for 6 p.m. GMT, Europe's main stock markets were all subdued. The FTSE 100, German DAX and French CAC were all in the red initially, with investors reluctant to take big positions before tonight's drama. We'll have more expert analysis on this topic later in the program. In one of the most aggressive anti-Israel resolutions yet, Iceland capital Reykjavik passed a resolution stating the municipality will boycott all products made in the Jewish state. The motion notes that Reykjavik will boycott Israeli goods as long as the, quote, occupation of Palestinian territories continues. Israel's foreign ministry responded to the move by saying that a volcano of hate exploded in the building of the Reykjavik municipality, slamming its one-sided approach. Iceland Magazine reported that the municipality's decision has caused some controversy, with a local attorney claiming it violates the Icelandic constitution. With 329,000 people, Iceland has the smallest population in Europe and recently recovered from the lows of the Great Recession, held by tourism after its entire banking system systematically failed in 2008. America's fourth-largest operator, Cablevision, agreed to a $17.7 billion takeover offer by European telecommunications company Altis. Through the acquisition, Altis, which is controlled by French Israeli businessman Patrick Gray, becomes a major force in the lucrative U.S. cable market. Shares of Cablevision jumped as much as 16 percent to $33.12 as details of the takeover deal, which includes Cablevision's debt, became public. Altis, which will pay $34.90 in cash per share, a 22 percent premium on Wednesday's closing price of $28.54, and will reportedly finance the deal with $3 billion from a share sale and $7 billion in debt. Altis's takeover of Cable Fission follows its $9.1 billion May acquisition of Suddenlink, the seventh largest U.S. cable company. China's State Administration of Foreign Exchange dismissed worries about huge capital outflows on Thursday ahead of a potential rate hike in the U.S. Department Director with the Administration of Foreign Exchange said in a news conference, depreciation pressure on the Chinese yuan has been largely released and its value has almost stabilized. The yuan has substantially depreciated against the U.S. dollar since August, and China maintains a large trade surplus. Given that China's economic fundamentals are still sound, he said, there's no basis for a large-scale outflow of foreign capital. In the first eight months this year, China's trade surplus was over $300 million. Actual utilization of foreign capital reached over $800 million. Overall, there's a $500 million monthly basic surplus for balance of international payments. This is an important support base against depreciation in renminbi exchange rates. And we're joined now on Sky by financial markets expert Andy Bush for a look at what's at stake as the Federal Reserve decides on borrowing costs. Andy. Benjamin, how you doing? Good, good. The media is filled with every opinion imaginable about the Fed's upcoming decision on its main rate. What do you see? Well, the Fed's indicated to the markets that it, it said it wants to raise rates sometime in 2015. This is the best time to do it. They need to raise rates just to get off the zero bound. There's a lot of reasons for or against it. I think they can mitigate any rate hike by then reducing their projections for what interest rates will be at the end of 2015 and at the end of 2016. So there's going to be a lot of moving parts to this. So just be careful. The headline announcement may not get the market reaction that you're looking for. Well, so far, the market reaction is confusion. I mean, will we see a slow hike in borrowing costs, as promised before? Will we have more guidance? Well, I think that's the big takeaway, and you make a great point. This Fed has done a horrible job at communicating to the markets. Remember, going all the way back to 2013, during the taper tantrum, Ben Bernanke said that they were going to stop quantitative easing in September, and then they didn't do it 
that created all sorts of craziness in the markets for a long period of time. And now Janet Yellen has been doing almost the same thing, saying they're going to raise rates at some point. Then every opportunity that comes up, they stop doing it. So they need to set a course and tell us what they're going to do and stop going back and forth on this because it's just it's not helpful and it adds to the uncertainty when you have things like China and uh, uh, you know uncertainty over immigration in Europe there's all sorts of things that are negative for the markets this one needs to be set aside okay now since you just mentioned China I mean what else are markets looking at the US China meeting Yes, definitely. And in regards to the last story that you just did on China, I, I find it humorous that they said that the, the renminbi is stabilizing here. That's ridiculous. They, they told the markets they were going to devalue it. And when the markets went crazy because they weren't sure how far they were going to devalue, um, China had to intervene to the tune of almost 100 billion U.S. dollars to, to slow it down. And just even today, you see that their markets are down 2%. That's still very, very unstable. And as far as this meeting with President Obama goes, um, we're not sure exactly if the U.S. is going to put sanctions on China for their cybersecurity breaches. So a lot of uncertainty for next week as those two meet. Okay, well, a lot of uncertainty all around. Andy Bush, thanks for joining us, giving some more information about what to expect, what lies ahead as the Fed comes to a decision. Thank you. The traditional bazaar has long been the place to shop in the Islamic Republic, but despite years of sanctions, a new generation of Iranians has discovered a vastly different consumer experience, blatant, unapologetic Western-style consumerism. Far from the meandering markets echoing with the sound of haggling, most Iranians like to do their shopping here, in huge malls boasting multiple floors of retail space. The concept is undeniably Western, but Western brands are seldom found. They have to be smuggled in, and they're sold at vastly inflated prices. It's very difficult to get original spare parts here, and they cost a lot. There are also difficulties with customer service and repair. For instance, because there's no official Apple representative here, many customers and sellers suffer losses. Still, Iranians have embraced shopping centers. Developers have broken ground on an estimated 400 modern malls across the country in recent years, 65 of them in Tehran alone. They're banking on the buying potential of the country's youthful population, despite a lack of foreign products. Iran, uh, Over the past 10 years, Iran was having problems with the international community. As a consequence, now the country has to deal with an accumulated lack of foreign investment. But the expected lifting of sanctions imposed over Iran's disputed nuclear program could open the door to a potential retail bonanza, especially for imported Western goods, a boon for the country's economy. We feel that with the removal of sanctions, we will witness a new situation and a new set of conditions in terms of brands in Iran. At least in the field of clothing and fashion, there will be cultural changes and aesthetic transformations. Ever since the nuclear deal was struck, ties between Iran and Western countries have increasingly warmed up. Sanctions could be lifted as early as 2016, and without them, Iran's dense population and oil and gas-rich lands have the potential to attract much-awaited foreign investment. Over well, now to the UK, where Jeremy Corbyn, the new leader of Britain's Labour Party, took the Prime Minister's question session into a new era by giving some of the 40,000 respondents to his crowdsourced campaign a voice. Here's more. It was his first ever question time. On Wednesday, the newly elected Jeremy Corbyn faced off with David Cameron for the UK's traditional question period. But right out of the gate, the new leader of the Labour Party sought to impose his own style. Breaking with convention, he selected his six questions from the public, having crowdsourced ideas online. I sent out an email to thousands of people and asked them what questions they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And I received 40,000 replies. Of the 40,000 responses, Jeremy Corbyn selected the most relevant questions. 
or perhaps those pertaining to the subjects he's most passionate about, such as health care, the local housing crisis, and the reduction of social benefits. Yesterday in the House, when uh, the House sadly voted through proposals which are going to cost £1,300 per year to families affected by the change in tax credits. These are familiar themes for the 66-year-old Labour Party leader, a fierce opponent of austerity. They call us deficit deniers, but then they spend billions cutting taxes for the richest families and for the most profitable businesses. Why, what they, what they are is poverty deniers. They're ignoring the growing queues at food banks, they're ignoring the housing crisis. They're cutting tax credits when child poverty rose by half a million um, under the last government to over four million. Let's be clear. Austerity is actually a political choice that this government has taken, and they're imposing it on the most vulnerable and poorest in our society. Corbyn's economic program is in line with the Spanish Podemos and Greek Syriza parties. It includes campaigns for nationalizations, increased state intervention, and a greater tax contribution from the rich to help the poor. Dubbed Corbynomics, the economic agenda championed by the budding Labour leader received the support of about 40 economists earlier this week, as well as that of former Greek finance minister Yanis Varoufakis. I'm not here to seek your solidarity for Greece. I'm here to offer the Greek people's solidarity to the people of Britain in what you're embarking upon. But even as he enlists the backing of activists and celebrities, support for Jeremy Corbyn is far from unanimous, and most of his campaign platforms have been questioned as misguided or unrealistic. Austerity or not, the United Kingdom is one of the best-performing countries in the European Union. The unemployment rate is below 5.5%, and this year, growth should reach up to 2.8%, a figure twice as high as the Eurozone average. We shift now to the Startup Nation as we're joined on the set by Shai Welkomir, CEO and co-founder of Elasticode, an audience intelligence platform for real-time mobile user experience personalization. Shai, thanks for joining us. Happy to be here. Okay, great. So let me just start out. What is an audience intelligence platform? <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, it's, a, it's an engine. It's a platform that enables every marketer, publisher to basically provide a different experience to a different audience, a different segment, a di right. different person. Every time when he opens his app, he will get a different experience. You might get a different experience from another person. That's the basic premise of it. So essentially anyone with a mobile phone or iPad or anything that's essentially you know, connected to the cloud, so to speak, exactly. so has if, access to it. Yeah, so exactly. If, if, I'm, like, um, if I'm like a publisher of, a, of an app, uh, of a newspaper app or maybe a service app, right. and you will open my app, so uh, what brought you to download that app and open it for the first place? Maybe it was a specific campaign that brought you in, or maybe you're right now um, opening it in a different location from your home. I see. So you might get a different experience to get you through those early stages of the app and get you through there right. and get you more engaged differently maybe from me opening it in a different zone or a different location. Okay, and how did you come across this idea? Okay, so that's a, that's a nice uh, uh, story, but the, the, the basic of it would be it came from a need that we had. We had a company uh, that developed mobile apps for publishers and marketers for a couple of years, and that actually sprung out uh, organically from the need of our customers that wanted something like that. That led us to build a platform and then later on sold our company to make this the, uh, the product we want to build and actually have a company of. Okay, I mean, how, would you say that this story is very typical of, so to speak, the startup nation? Um, Based on how you described it now? <laughs> yeah, I think that it, it, it's a funny story, but, but a lot of things um, Israeli don't think for granted. I mean, if something is broken or something is not working, we don't just let it, you know, be as it is. We want right. to fix it. Yeah. And whether there is a potential, uh, I would say, business logic behind it or not, we're, in most cases, one know how to make that work. Okay. And do you have any specific advice to young entrepreneurs? Um, if you're starting a company or if you're thinking of starting a company, I would say that the most um, 
the best advice I can give you is have passion about what you're doing, basically because it's going to be hard. And if you won't have the stickiness to go through the whole uh, process, uh, it's going to be much harder. <laughs> Clearly. Now, I mean, you're involved in other projects as well beyond Elasticode. Uh, well, you know, uh, the Startup Nation, as an entrepreneur and, and as a whole in the Startup Nation, you can be like just, you know, limited or pigeonholed for course, something. No. Everything you're always building things and working on other things. Exactly. So basically, this, this, this whole uh, Elasticode itself was born from another company that we had in the first place. But basically, uh, being part of this huge ecosystem in Israel and, and the whole startup nation itself. I mean, it lets you be a part of other projects, um, hackathons, right. building stuff, okay. helping other entrepreneurs. I think our that. viewers have a pretty good understanding of Elasticode. Shai, welcome here. Thank you so much for joining us. I uh, hope to hear more about it, what, uh, what you guys are doing. And that concludes our Economy Magazine, your daily source for economic reports at i24 News. I'm Benjamin Chong Follow me on Twitter at Chong And of course, join us again next week. Thank you.